Hey there and thank you for tuning into Duck Bricks. I'm Chris aka The Brick Archivist and today we're going to be taking a look at another canonized Bionicle model which was created by a fan. In this case we are looking at the awesome Melding Pterodax. This is Makuta Pterodax from an alternate universe where he was good and some of the other characters who were good in the main universe were bad and kind of a flip scenario right there. So it's really awesome to see this guy. This is personally one of my favorite canonized models, maybe dethroned by the newest Artaka model, but we'll get to that when we get to that one. And I think it's safe to say that just aesthetically speaking, out of pretty much every fan-created model that had been canonized for G1, this was probably one of, if not the best models ever created. And so we'll be taking a look at this model and ranking it on a very special scale. If you've seen any of our other videos, namely the one on Makuta Miserix, we developed a scale and I'm trying to further improve that to really try to give a clear understanding of how I feel about the model. And so the scale boils down to four things, posability, building techniques, aesthetics, and basically how well it makes sense within the Bionicle story. What I mean by this last point is that essentially this is supposed to be, for example, depicting Makuta Pterodax. So really if this did not look like him, for example, and I will say it does, but if it didn't, then it would be kind of knocked off some points on that regard. So that's kind of what I mean by that. And so let's start off by taking a look at this model. Before we get started though, I want to make one small note, and I will say that this model, a lot of effort was put into it to make the color scheme completely consistent pretty much everywhere and even in places where you're gonna have to really squint hard and look around the model to notice if something was off. Like for example, a lot of the pins used or the axles even, say for example the two length axles, are used in white which is a very rare color for that piece. It only appeared in a few sets and normally the two length axle is used in red or black. But just to keep up with this color scheme, they made it white, they went the extra effort and honestly it's such a small thing where that if black was used, it probably wouldn't have made a huge difference, but I do appreciate the amount of effort that went into making the color scheme consistent. And that being said, the same kind of goes for pieces where I honestly feel like I could have probably saved some money without having to buy those expensive parts. I spent a few dollars on, for example, white Technic bushings, and there's one that you can barely see throughout the front crack of this armor, and another one that's kind of really tucked away near the back of the head. So honestly, those are kind of the things that you really don't notice too much. And quite frankly, for the half technic bushing, which comes in light gray normally, most of the parts on here as complementary colors are light gray, so it really wouldn't have bugged me that much if it were light gray instead of white. But that's just one thing to keep in mind if you want to build this model yourself. Just look at every single one of the rare white Technic pieces and try to decide for yourself, is it actually worth getting that piece in white just for this model? Or if you look at the model as a whole and say, oh, well, I probably wouldn't notice if, say, the axle used on the back of the foot uh, was black instead of white or dark gray or light gray instead of white, then that's really a choice for you to decide. The other thing I will say right off the bat is that before we get into things really fully, the main con with this model is that the hammer just cannot be posed whatsoever. It really is only connected on one Technic pin. It rotates, it causes the hand to swing around. Unfortunately, you can't really maintain a good pose for it unless you put the base of the hammer on the ground. And even then it looks kind of awkward. As soon as you pick it up, that hammer just flops down. And honestly, that's really disappointing to me. I really feel like there was a better way that could have done this which could have basically elevated this model beyond just a display model and to also be played with because quite frankly other than that it's a pretty good play model. So what I'm going to do before we start off the review, I'm going to take that hammer off and we'll get to that when I mention posability but we're just going to remove it for now because I can't even pick up the model without the hammer just flopping off. And Unfortunately, because of that, I've actually damaged the claw piece. The axle has been put under a lot of strain from that hammer flopping around. I'm actually kind of worried I'm gonna be damaging this piece further by leaving the hammer on by moving this around. So we're gonna set it aside for now and just look at the model as a whole, and then we can talk about the hammer later. And so with that out of the way, let's get into things and get started with this review of the Melding Makuta Pterodax. Let's take a look at this model, starting off with the posability of it. And you'll notice that the first thing that stands out is that unfortunately the posability, while it is there, it isn't amazing. Just because of the way that the legs are built and how compact they are, you really can't rotate the knee joint all that much. 
there's a pretty fixed limit of knee positions that you can move this in, but there is a pro to this, and that is that it kind of makes the model a lot more stable. He's not gonna be tipping backwards and falling over because his knees are bending too much. The fact that the knees are pretty fixed to this angle of motion really makes the model a lot more stable, so quite frankly, I don't really care too, too much about that. Same for the feet, they're relatively restricted, but they are still pretty good. You can't really rotate them side to side because of the combination of this Toa Metru foot and flat dark gold here, as well as the hoses just really restricting the motion there. But honestly, again, that's not a huge deal to me because you don't really need that level of rotation for the feet. And quite frankly, having them would probably cause it to be a lot less stable. When we go up to the front here, you notice I had to add some of the newer CCBS friction joints. The problem with it is that I really just couldn't get this to stand up on its own. A lot of that could be because the parts that I was using were probably pretty old and just couldn't sustain the clutch of moving legs that are this heavy. But by putting on the friction adders, honestly, they don't detract too much away from how the model looks. And it makes it a lot more sturdy for play scenarios and moving this around for different poses. So that's pretty much okay with me. Other than that though, nothing too special going on with the legs. You have some range of articulation for the knees, feet, and then pretty much the whole range of articulation for the upper part of the leg here. Then moving on, we actually have a bit of a surprise. We have waist articulation alongside here. So that is really cool to get. And what's nice is that the way that these flat dark gold armor pieces are positioned, they almost act like kind of buffers. And if you push it too far one way, he kind of resets back to the other side and facing straight. So I really kind of like how they've set these up such that there's enough flex in these side pieces that allow you to move it around. The one downside though is that if you pick it up and you have a weak joint, it's literally only secured by just one axle. So this is literally the only thing holding the top of the body to the bottom. So if the bottom is heavy and you pick it up and you don't have a good joint, it could just very easily just have the legs fall off there. And that is a bit of a con to me. There are a few ways that I can think of that they could have locked this down a little bit better in my opinion. But as it is right now, it's not a huge, huge deal. And especially because these two flat dark gold pieces kind of keep it in as well because the way that they hook around this piece kind of secure the body. So it's not a huge deal to me. And then moving upwards to the head, obviously you just have the standard range of articulation for the head. Since they're using the Mata head piece, you do have a bit of a restriction when you want to turn it over to the side just because of the way that that's set up. If you look at the back here, you can see exactly how this is set up. Oh, that piece just came off. So yeah, it's, it's not the best of setups, but it does work and it does give you a pretty fair amount of articulation and far more than, of course, a lot of the other characters had. So it's pretty much okay to me. And then continuing along here, you'll notice that on the back of them, they have these tubes going alongside from the back to the arms. And this is kind of where we get to another con in articulation. As soon as you move the arm forwards, this tube will just fall out. And I've really experimented with shorter tubes, longer tubes. If the tubes are too long, then they can cause this piece to fall out because it's really only held on there pretty weakly. So if you had a longer tube and then suddenly move the arm forwards, it can tend to cause this tube to spring all the way out and cause this piece here to just fall out because it's adhered so loosely to the back. So Honestly, I really could have done without the tubes. I don't think they add too, too much to the model, especially this far back. And the instruction manual even just has you stick them in there. These aren't connected to anything. So that kind of makes it a little bit worse for me personally. And quite frankly, when I'm displaying this, I often just leave the tubes off because I just simply can't move the arms that well without having the tubes just come off, just like that. But then putting it back on, presumably you're supposed to have a generally good range of articulation that is without the tubes in. So let's just take off the tube for now on this arm. And then that kind of brings me to another con, which is how exactly the upper arms are built. You can see that there's nothing actually holding it on to this piece here. And all of these pieces kind of move around independently of each other. You kind of see how I've split the arm into three parts. And the way that it's supposed to work is that you kind of just stick this borok tooth piece into the hole there it's not actually held in by anything and you grab the arm as a whole and you move it around like this but then if you move around the hand like so you can very easily just get that out of the arm and cause it to kind of bend in ways that don't look good and probably ways that really aren't very structurally stable especially for an arm like this so 
that is one minor con of it. I feel like there was a better way to build this where you could have somehow managed to adhere the pieces all together so this acts as one unit instead of stuff that can very easily just come separated like that. But then moving on, once we put this back together, we have the front of the hand. Honestly, not a huge deal here in terms of anything special going on. You just have standard armor pieces wrapped around. There is one downside I feel to the fingers here and the way that this is set up because basically you have these hands but the only way to attach accessories or have them hold anything is with this one single Technic pin and this hand itself is only attached by one ball joint. So it's not like say the normal style of hand for Bionicle figures where they have a ton of different attachment points you can have them hold all sorts of different things and I feel like this could have been very much improved by just attaching this claw piece to the standard Bionicle hand and just having that hand adhere to another set of ball joints. And that would have solved a lot of problems with him not being able to hold his weapon, as I mentioned earlier. But, you know, that is how it is. And I will say from an aesthetic point of view, it does look better just having the claw kind of come out of the hand here. So I guess you win some, you lose some. Essentially, everything is identical on this other side of the arm, right down to the flaws in the upper arm and the way that this arm is built. And he does have a Technic pin here to attach his hammer to. So right now I'm gonna attach his hammer and I'm gonna kind of demonstrate what I mean by the fact that he really can't strike a pose with this because first of all, you'll notice that this flops back and forth along the hinge here. So even if his hand is completely set, the hammer just automatically flops back and forth depending on how you hold it. The other thing is that the hammer can tend to flop this way as well. And I've literally had to stick a piece of tissue in between the hammer here to stop it from doing it that much because when I first built this, the hammer just kept flopping on the side like this and detaching his arm. So you can see I've done my best to kind of make this work, but it's still just really, you just can't hold it up. The hammer is just so heavy. It looks good. It's a good looking build. And I mean, this is an amazing looking hammer build, but he really just can't support the weight of his own hammer. The only way to really get this working in a position where he can hold it relatively well is by having him kind of lift it up by the other hand. And even then you can only really get it at a pretty horizontal angle right here. And then at that point, you can't really do much with the hammer in terms of posing. It's not like you can strike a pose like he's hoisting the hammer up to swing it at someone. He just kind of has it down and he's resting it on his leg because of the weight of it. And you really can't strike any other poses besides just the one pose where he has his hammer straight like this or just one where he has it across his body like this. And there are ways that you can mess around with this to make it look cool, but you can't get it even into something like this because you'll notice the weight of the hammer just immediately causes the arm to fold down. So that is, in my opinion, a major, major con. Honestly, one of the things that I was most disappointed with for this model is that you have this fantastic model. It looks really great, and obviously the aesthetics are really good, but then you've got this hammer that you really can't do anything with unless just having him hold it straight on like this. So honestly, that was a really disappointing aspect to this build for me. And quite frankly, I've been looking into ways to kind of re-engineer the hand design such that maybe you're going to get it to not look nearly as good as it looks right now, but just to make it a little bit more stable so he can actually hold that hand. But now let's reset his position and start to talk about aesthetics. All right, so now that we've got him right here, I think that the really interesting thing to look at is just how well does this model look as a whole? And I think anyone who's watching this video probably has an appreciation for how this is built. And you know what? So do I. I think it's really great how they managed to integrate the three Rakshi spines to form the chest here. That's such a cool detail to me that looks really good for the front torso of this model it really does look like makuda both from the movies and how he's described in the books so this just looks really good i also appreciate how well they've integrated the white rubber bands because of course these are kind of a notorious piece unless you use them with the associated rakshi torso and neck piece you really can't get them to stay in a fixed position and the builder's done an excellent job of kind of tucking away rubber bands that are expertly laid out that really just tie them back and secure them very well to the main body. So 
That is one thing I really appreciate here. It's not like these are loose whatsoever. They're really tightly rooted in. And that's something that's built really well for this. In terms of the overall aesthetics, the flat dark gold looks really good, especially with the flat dark gold croc on here, as well as basically all of the white exterior parts. The fact that they used a lot of the rarer, harder to find white Technic parts to make this model really does make it stand out. And I honestly think that going the extra mile in terms of making those work and choosing those rare parts for this build really paid off in the end. Like for example, this piece right here is one of the white Technic axle and pin pieces used for the Karak and Garak teeth. And honestly, if they used a blue one there, it really would not have worked out nearly as well as it does here. So all sorts of good decisions made in terms of the color scheme here. I feel like in the back, if I were to really nitpick, the fact that you can very easily just see through this Inika armor in the back legs here and see that there's a lot of black stuff that goes inside there. Honestly, I feel like they could have plugged the holes a little bit better there, but it's not a huge, huge deal. And the fact that everything else all around looks really good is probably pretty much fine to me. The other thing is that it's really nice how they actually made the shaping of the armor blend very well. They used the pretty rare flat dark gold Metru chest piece, which only appeared on Toa Likon, so I paid like $5 for this one piece. But they used it in the back here to kind of blend upwards with the Knight's Kingdom flat dark gold armor and then blend all the way upwards to white. But now kind of moving on from aesthetics, it's kind of time to talk about the building techniques, which I have mentioned previously throughout this video. But there are a few things that stand out to me as not really the best kind of building techniques or stuff that could have been done better. I already mentioned the tubes here, but if you look at this piece and it just fell off again, you can see right here, it's only using half of the axle here to attach it to this very shallow Technic piece. And the fact that the tubes are actively pushing this piece out really don't help it all that much. And it's kind of a pain to push this in really hard every single time to just make it fit all the way in here. The other thing that I will say about how this is built is again, the hands I think could have been done a little bit better in terms of how they were made. And especially those upper arms, I think the building techniques could have been really improved here to make it not only so that the hoses don't just fall out immediately, but also so that this doesn't split into three separate pieces. And I also don't really know why this piece is here. This is a pretty rare piece to get. It only appeared in like Kreka and a few other sets. And it honestly just kind of sits there and does nothing. So not really sure why that's there. Some strange choices used here to be sure. So those are, if I'm really getting nitpicky, some of my cons with the building experience here. The other thing is that Again, this hammer built very well in terms of just being a hammer. It looks really good. It's really solid. Some really cool shaping done for the build. He just can't hold it whatsoever. That's a major con against the building techniques and something I really wish could have been improved for this model. But let's zoom out and talk about this model as a whole and how it ranks on the scale as well as address the final point. How well does it fit within universe? All right, so who is the melding pterodex? Well, to give a brief backstory for who this character is, the Melding Alternate Universe was one of the many alternate universes explored during Bionicle's entire story run. One of their main writers, Greg Farshti, was a notorious fan of comic books and loved the concept of alternate universes because he loved the idea of being able to throw out all of the established rules for a world and just look at a world if certain things had been changed or tweaked to approach things from a different angle. This character is one of his favorites to do in an alternate universe version because having a good version of your main villain is always something that's really interesting, especially in comic books, and Greg Farshti wanted to do this in Bionicle as well. And hence the Melding the Alternate Universe Pterodax was born. The Melding Universe refers to a special dimension where Matoran were actually the warriors of the entire world, so they were like the Toa characters, and the Toa-sized people were just the lowly villagers. So in this universe, the reason why the Matoran were much smaller than the Toa and yet still served the purpose of being guardians were that their small stature and very quick reflexes could allow them to overcome a lot more cumbersome and large opponents. So 
kind of an interesting concept to play with there. And of course, this was over a time where Teradax did not actually have the ambition to take over Matanui's body, and instead he stuck to the light version of himself that was created, which kind of results in this. He claims that he is more powerful than the main universe's version of Teradax because he has overcome the darkness within him, and to show that he wears the Mask of Darkness, the Kanohi Crocodile, or the Mask of Shadows, on his head, just to kind of proudly say that, yes, he does have his inner darkness, but he overcame it. So kind of a pretty cool concept for a character. And so this guy is supposed to essentially just be Makuta Teradax, but with white armor and slightly larger. So honestly, our best comparison is to take the set for Makuta Teradax himself and see how they compare. And to be honest, given that this was a Titan from 2003, and this was the largest scale of Bionicle character that they really were doing at that time frame, this works very, very well as a representation of this model. You can see that some of the exact same parts were used, like the Nuva shoulder armor up here. He uses the Nuva shoulder armor in white. He, of course, has his front chest piece being made out of the Rakshi armor, which you can see right here, and even the legs being curved Rakshi Krata holders, you can see they took inspiration from this and used the same exact parts here, except they've actually given him knees this time, which the first Pterodax famously did not have. In fact, he couldn't even rotate his feet. This was all the articulation you were getting out of the legs of this guy. So, as much as I was complaining about some of the strange articulation in this model, this is what it's being compared to. So, Honestly, I feel like this is just a major step up in almost every way. And I love how the builder even managed to include the waist articulation that this Makuta had as well. The main one had it by twisting a gear in the back, but it wasn't that good because it had no friction, so he could kind of just flop around when you were playing with him. This one actually does it with a ball joint, so it's done much better than the set, of course, because this was made years after the set came out, but I think it's just such a solid improvement over the actual set, while still clearly representing the exact same character. And even if we were to take other alternate versions of Makuta, like say this Takuta Nuva figure right here, and place them next to each other, they work really well together, and you can very clearly see the design influences that went into beings like this compared to the melding pterodax right here. But now, let's take a look at how it compares next to Takanuva. So, there was a very iconic fight sequence that this guy was engaged in in one of these story serials where he fought a bunch of evil versions of Takanuva and just utterly smashed them to pieces. It was said that he took his hammer and just smashed their masks because he was just so much more powerful than they were. And honestly, if you look at this stature right here, I can very easily see this guy smashing a ton of people this size because just look at how big he is compared to Takanuva. I think that the scaling done here is actually really cool, and honestly, they look pretty good together because they both use that flat dark gold color. Even when we compare him to the more modern, or actually the most modern canonized Bionicle model, which, bringing over our Taka here, let's take a look. We'll have a video review of this guy coming up soon once the pieces for his hammer finally arrive. You can see that they are scaled almost perfectly next to each other, which is really cool to me. You can see right here how Artaka was one of the original beings created by the great beings, and how Pterodax was also one of these early creatures who was made for the Bionicle universe, and just how well they scaled together is really cool to me, and I'm definitely going to be displaying these two next to each other on the shelf. But so that about wraps up our review of the alternate melding version of Makuta Teradax. Such a cool model, and honestly, I'm really torn between which is my favorite fan-created canonized model, this one or this one. I honestly kind of flip-flop back and forth between them on a day-to-day -day basis because they're just both really good models to me. But now it's time to take a look at the scoring for this model. So in terms of overall aesthetics, I gotta give this one a 10 out of 10. Despite the very minor nitpicks that I gave it, like, for example, some strange parts usage and maybe you could see some parts in the back of his legs, this is nearly perfect to what I imagined the alternate form of Pterodax to be looking like, so personally I think it deserves a 10 out of 10 on aesthetics. In terms of building techniques, I'm honestly going to have to give this one an 8 out of 10 because while the building techniques are really good, just how wonky the upper arms are and the fact that he can't even hold his hammer up straight without it resting on the ground, that really takes out a lot of the building techniques to me. So 
I honestly feel like there were a lot of ways it could have been improved here. The legs, I think, are amazing. The torso is amazing. It's just everything to do with the arms, from the tubes going into the back, to the way the hands are set up, to the fact he can't hold the hammer. That just really takes away from the building technique score for the set. So honestly, I'm going to have to take some points away there, but it's not a huge, huge deal in my opinion. And for the next point, posability, I honestly think I'm also going to have to give this one an 8 or maybe an 8.5 out of 10. It just really bugs me how I can't get this into a pose with him holding the hammer well remotely at all, other than just holding it straight or holding it just flat in front of him. The way that it's built really takes away from this model here. And honestly, everything else about the posability of this model, from the waist articulation to how the legs work, to the head, to the arms, everything else is fantastic. It's just the hammer that weighs it down. So. I think, given that the fact that the model itself is a great display model if he's not holding his weapon, I think I'll give that one an 8.5 out of 10, because it does do a really good job in every other way of making it being very poseable, right down to even having the waist articulation. And then, for the final point, how well does it fit within canon or make sense for the prompt? Yeah, that one's going to have a 10 out of 10. You can see just how well he represents a light version of Makuta, just built stronger and able to pose a physical threat. So I really do think that it was a good choice kind of going with the Rakshi spines here, keeping it within the aesthetic of the other Makuta that we can see here. So I do think that this was done very well in terms of having it fit into the story. And so that about wraps up the review of the alternate Melding Pterodax. This model was built by BZ Power member Triome for a contest to build the alternate Makuta, so well done on that. One of the best canonized models ever. I think this is absolutely amazing, and I really would highly encourage builders to create their own, because if you ignore the hammer, this is a very, very solid model, and if you're willing to make some compromises in terms of colors of Technic pins and whatnot, it's not going to be extremely expensive and probably even cheaper than some of the older Bionicle Titan sets, like say the Toa Mata Nui or Maxilos and Spinax. I'm sure those ones are going for a lot more money and the fact that you're able to part this out from Bricklink I think does actually help the price a lot. And if you're interested in looking out tips and tricks on how to actually buy models like this or just other custom models in general from Bricklink, go ahead and check out a video linked in the description below. It's one of the recent videos we put out that kind of walks you through how to price optimize on that end. But thank you all for checking in. I really appreciate your viewership and stay tuned to Duck Breaks for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussions, and analyses coming your way very soon. Next time we're going to be checking out, if not Artaka, at least one of the Dark Hunters as a group, or maybe some of the Rahi. So we're really going to play it by ear and see what people want to see more. And so if you have any suggestions, please let us know in the comments below. And thank you all for tuning in. Bye bye for now.